Hey everyone, welcome to Neighbor Science, the only podcast about political economy and anime. Uh, I'm your host, Ryan Salisbury. Today we're supposed to have Chris. I'm hoping he shows up later. That's okay, because today we have a great guest for you. It's Leslie Lee the Third from Struggle Session. How you doing, Leslie? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming on, man. Um, that's really cool of you. So today we are doing the last episode of Isekai July, which is a mini series so powerful that it had to go on into August. So this is the last episode of it. Uh, we are doing a show called Drifters, which I think is one of the most unique concepts uh, for the Isekai series that we've looked at so far. Um, it's like actual historical figures that are sent to another world, and they're just fighting this like grand battle between one another and uh, the people from that world. Um, it's by Hirano Kota, who is uh, the author of the famous manga Helsing, which did you ever watch Helsing, Leslie? Yeah, yeah, I watched. Uh, I, I watched all of the first series. I didn't watch uh, Helsing Ultimate. But yeah, I really, really liked Helsing. It was a lot of fun. I, of course, it borrowed heavily from um, something like Vampire Hunter D, uh, Castlevania, even. But I, I think it was still like a really interesting, unique, um, like vision, uh, uh, vision of like a future sci-fi c- kind of like fantasy battle world. And Drifters is just like complete is even like weirder and bigger and better than that like to just the concept of it because it's like it's like it in like as far as genre goes it feels like it's very influenced by game of thrones it feels like a very much like this guy like and game of thrones is popular in japan it feels like this guy like watched the first season of game of thrones and was like all right now i got some ideas uh for the manga i'm sure it didn't happen like that but and there so there's all these you know focus on like these lords and battles and all this but then you bring in all these historical figures and instead of just having them have like you know fights like from like mortal Kombat or whatever where it's just one-on-one fights it's like they all have their different roles to play like you know scipio and hannibal hannibal's real old because he uh, died uh really old so he's more of a strategist uh, as is Oda, when you, but you, then you do have the characters with like super ninja powers and shit too. Yeah. So it's like a very interesting. Like it could have just been that. It could have just been super ninja uh, Hannibal uh, fighting its uh, super uh, ninja, you know, uh, Alexander the Great or whatever. That could have been the the show, but they tried to do something a little bit more interesting uh, with it. Yeah, that could have been cool too. But I think what they did was was pretty interesting. Let's see, the manga started in 2009, so it's actually very old, relatively, and it's still ongoing. It's on, like, volume six or seven right now. Um, I read ahead to volume five, and, um, yeah, there's still a pretty long way from resolving the story. Still don't know who the Black King is. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, now that I look at it, uh, the first episode of Game of Thrones aired in 2011, so this predates... The TV show Game of Thrones, the not books. the book. Well, the books. Yeah. Is it the books that are popular in Japan, or is it the show? As far as I know, it was just the show. I, I okay. I'm not sure. They, it is possible, but because it does seem like heavily, like like you just said, like the Black King is a very similar to was it the Night King? Oh yeah, the in, Night uh, King. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's just. I, I a, have, a I've only seen one episode of Game of Thrones, but I still know half the characters because it was such a cultural phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what did we think overall of Drifters? For me, I think the art direction was really cool. It looks to me like a Western comic book, like not even so much like a manga. I think mainly it's because of the really thick lines, but also, I don't know, just like the way that the colors are used and everything. It it just, to me, looks like a Western comic book. But uh, what, what do you think of the art? I, re- I really like like art. I'm not a big fan of almost any of uh, how modern anime uh, looks. Uh, like I I really like only watch anime that was basically like that came out on VHS. If it didn't get released on VHS, I generally don't watch it. But this <laughs> looks like really good. Like I never had like some poor animation uh, take me out of the show 
except for when it's supposed to with like the GB uh, character uh, stuff. But yeah. yeah, I I really I really uh, like how it looks. It looks really cool. Lots of like light and dark shadows like for a modern anime like this is probably the best that i've i've watched yeah i gotta say the the manga actually looks even cooler to me um i mean it doesn't have the color going for it but a lot of the panels look like like woodcut prints which woodcut is one of my favorite styles you can see in the notes i like copied some of the some of the panels out of there and yeah that they look i guess sort of uh like a Ellie Valley comic almost. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at the art from it now. It, lo- it does look really, really good. Yeah, like my 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 fate, my first love in anime and manga is, uh, of course, Berserk. And I, right. you know, there's so few things I would recommend to people after Berserk. I think Drifters might come close to something. I would say, yeah, all right, if you don't, if you're not rewatching uh, Ber- Berserk again, maybe check out, you know, Drifters. It's it's got some, it's got really similar art styles, um, really uh, lots of really really good action too. I actually uh, got like the first like collected volume of berserk because of your podcast (laughs) i still have to read it but (laughs) oh yeah enjoy 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 yeah looking forward to it um let's see let's talk about the story briefly like we already mentioned the basic concept um so they the drifters go to uh this place called the orte empire which is like based on like a european empire and it in the anime it's revealed that it's founded it was founded by hitler <laughs> yes i thought it was a really funny detail it's so fucking wow like who <laughs> thinks of that who would ever think of that yeah so like there so it's really not so it's a isekai so somebody transported to a different world so it's not really it hasn't been explained as far as far as i know like what this world actually is is it seems to kind of fit in our general medieval fantasy world so it seems kind of like a lord of the rings world more or less i yeah, think some people were a, comparing it to world of warcraft because they said the elves were like the dark elves in wow oh, okay <laughs> okay okay yeah so like a generic yeah so it's like a generic fantasy world but all the people that get transported aren't like modern day uh, people are salary men, right? They're, they're like yeah. all these great warriors from uh, different parts of history uh, brought back in order in this, you know, actually really bad plan. And they say in the show that the plan is really bad to just have all these warriors uh, come over and fight this dark lord who's like kind of like a Sauron figure uh, and bring all these random warriors in to lead the armies against him. And then, and then uh, when Oda gets there, he's like, what are you talking about? They're not going to follow me. I'm just some random like a Japanese person who died hundreds of years ago in a different reality. Right. Why would they follow me? <laughs> Um, oh, one thing I thought was really interesting about, about this Orte empire is like, they, they created like a fake language in the manga. It's just like, they just write in gibberish, but in the, in the anime, they actually went to the effort of like making up a fake language. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was really freaky too. Cause I, cause I, uh, I lived in Japan for a few years, so I, I, you know, spoke you know japanese fairly decently then but i'm I'm losing it now so when i was watching the ma- uh, the anime uh in the with the japanese language i was just like have i just like completely forgotten like everything about japanese because it because <laughs> it wouldn't make sense then i realized like oh the elves are speaking just kind of gibberish and they actually have different gibberish in the english version uh too so they oh, really went out of their way to i didn't kind get a dub of, at all so yeah i didn't I, realize I, I had one I, yeah, I thought I mostly, it was very funny though that like uh, they still use Japanese loan words for like like if they have a Western name, they'll still yeah, pronounce this, Mark as like Maruku. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it sounded kind of like. Uh, did you ever see that video of the Italians that were trying? They were pretending to speak American English. Oh yes, yes, yeah, it, yeah. It does like it that. Similar like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like Japanese people trying to speak like Portuguese or Catalan. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I also thought it was like a funny thing about the Orte being like a like an elf empire and being founded by Hitler is just like the associations with like what elves represent in fantasy stories 
they're like you know generally supposed to be like the white people of fantasy stories and their their empire was founded by hitler <laughs> well it, they're 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 the slaves in the empire oh that's so. true that's true yeah the, yeah the i did write this and... note in, in like episode two so <laughs> i didn't think about it after oh yeah that. It, it, you might yeah because they don't really give you a big explainer at any point of what the world is which i think is good that they uh don't do it you kind of have to pick up bits and pieces here and there and you realize that like when you when it first starts you might think like oh all the drifters end up in like this one island or something like this one place but then you realize like no it's an entire planet with all with different nations and nation states and countries that all, all are vying for supremacy but the biggest one being the orte uh, empire <laughs> founded by hitler on a you know campaign of human uh, dominance over all the um, dwarves, elves, and what they call demi demi humans, which are you know your orcs, your goblins, and your, uh, what have you. Yeah, that was interesting because uh, the previous episode uh, that we just did was um, about Tata no Yusha, the Rising of the Shield hero, and they have demi humans in that too, but they're half human, half animal, so it's like raccoon girls and stuff like that <laughs> so this is the second show in a row with demi humans <laughs> um, which seems like in itself like a slur right to call yes. someone a demi human that's one I of the things we talked about it was me and uh ricky rawls <laughs> oh okay okay yeah yeah so yeah one of the first things i noticed was uh i thought the main character toyohisa he reminds me a lot of mugen from samurai shampoo so i like really liked him right away like he has yeah. a similar like gruff attitude. He's like basically a complete dumbass other than being able to fight really good. <laughs> Yeah, and I like that the show, like, well, I mean, that would describe, like, most of this sort of uh, seinen um, uh, anime, like, heroes can be described as that. But the show recognizes, like, that he is a dumbass, and he only knows how to fight, and he recognizes, like, his flaws, too. Like, he, he at, at one certain point, he says, you know, I'm not a leader of men. I'm just a guy who's going to run into battle and probably get killed one day because I'm stupid. That's who I am. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like oh okay like this the this, this show really and like all the characters have such different um, personalities but his he's like because like and in most you know anime like every character would just be different versions of him right but that's not what really is going on in the show so he gets to stand out and seem really cool and badass when he's like slicing through like 15 uh different heads because like <laughs> there's other people who you know who can't fight at all you know ar around him who still have some other you know value as you know for strategy it's not like just a bunch of one note characters they all have their different strengths and weaknesses yeah, I really liked um, Nobunaga as well for that reason. He, you know, he's like completely the strategist character. He doesn't really fight at all, um, and he's extremely good at at that. I, I really liked um, this. I think this was in the OVA episode. Uh, he was talking about how the armies would not follow him because he's not the you know legitimate leader, and so he sends two messages out to each of the army divisions from the Orte Empire's offices in order to, like, destroy the armies so that he could rebuild them from scratch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because... I mean, and, and it's smart. Like, everything he says is just, like, real what you would at least uh more realistic than what you do get in like game of thrones right like there's no like talk of like strategy or how i'm gonna win this battle or what my long-term campaign is it's just i am queen because i it's my birthright this that and the other and th and that's it in game of thrones is just and just but stabbing each other in the back and that, that's all <laughs> there is to game of thrones right but this is like this show like really really gets into all right if we if we're gonna make this work, I gotta win these people over. I, I mean, and in order to do that, I'm gonna have to conquer them. I'm gonna uh, give these elves arms and like the when he burns the crops of the elves in order to make them turn on their human masters and then end up following. Uh, and then he sends in Toyohisa to like kill the you know the leader of the humans, making the elves look at Toyohisa like he's some god or something like that. That's so like that's so much smarter than most of these things similar action stuff ever tries to be you know right 
I did want to talk about like the the one thing that was really off putting about the show was like it's very homophobic, which I guess you could chalk up to that's just how feudal Japanese samurai would be. Yeah, I I, I really think like the characters are like confused and sometimes homophobic, and they have traditional like. Like uh, Toyohisa uh, wouldn't kill uh, jo- uh, Joan of Arc when he fights her because she's a woman. And he says there's no honor in killing a woman. And then, but there's people there from later eras, and they're like, "What the fuck are you talking about, Toyohisa? Like, women can fight too." So, so the show kind of acknowledges that there are that that there is a difference in these time periods and these views. And I don't really think the, the I think the characters can be homophobic. I'm not sure if the yeah. They still have uh, the offensive Okama stereotype. Of yeah, Sandra Me. Yeah, they do have the. Uh, the uh, but it's like it, you know, it's not more homophobic than like a, a bunch of other stuff, basically. Like a yeah. uh, than, than a standard anime, I would say, and it, it actually acknowledges that like uh, some like, has acknowledgement of like social progress in in uh, in a fashion because you have these characters coming from different time periods. Yeah, I think, I don't know, the politics are kind of confusing because they also kind of, um, you know, they have, like, favorable portrayals of, like, Japanese imperial soldiers. Yeah, and, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's so, it's so, it's so wild, but it's also like, oh, yeah, Hitler, you know, created this evil empire that en- yeah. enslaved all the elves and we have to free them. But also there's, a like, a kamikaze pilot who uh, shows up and fights the dragons and seems like he's going to be a good guy and y'all and he and uh there's a joke about him uh meeting someone who he thinks might be an american and he gets all pissed off right. I, I, <laughs> like it they're like so and then when, was, he, when he thinks that he's german he's like uh oh, apologize yeah. for or when he thinks he's italian he's, he's italian. like apologize to germany <laughs> yeah yeah he, he yeah he's he's yeah he gets mad because uh, i mean when when it comes to like world war Two. In, in and how Japan talks about it, and and it's not as simple as oh they just think nothing wrong happened and they were the good guys. It's not that, but they're it. But they but the way, especially when it comes to like Germany and like Nazi symbology, like there there's so many cartoons with Nazis in them. Like there's so many yeah. animes with Nazis in them, and that just just tell you like it's not viewed with the same in the same way that we view it in America. I I, I one time I was teaching and a student walked in and she had like a little like on her I, I think it was like it it was earrings. She had like a Nazi symbol on her earrings <laughs> because it was from like uh, uh, Italia. It was like she didn't just buy like uh, <laughs> a swastika like earrings. It was like a branded like thing that was produced. I'm like, I told her like, you know, you like like you can't wear that if you ever like go anywhere, you know. But yeah. it's the same thing with the um with the rising sun flag too, right. which is considered which yeah, they're starting consi- to ban those from anime conventions apparently. Yeah, which we uh, which Americans like really are enamored with and is used a lot right. in America, but, but we don't, but in Korea, it's seen as if it were a swastika. So that's, that's kind of the difference between how they, you know, how the swastika can be, uh, the Nazi swastika specifically is seen in, um, in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not, it's not as shocking. We kind of talked a little bit on previous episodes about how, um, Japan doesn't, like they don't teach their own imperial history to the same degree that a lot of countries like Germany especially does um so they haven't like really engaged with their like war criminal past on like on a mass public level so i think a lot of people just i don't know maybe don't know about that stuff or don't see it they just don't see it in the same way i guess i'm not sure yeah but then again, you know, who has reckoned with their war criminal past? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Germany somewhere. <laughs> but that's about it. Right. Yeah. Um, hey, Chris, how you doing? 
Hey, good. I'm so sorry I'm late. I, I the, the time zone mixed me up because I had it right and then I got sidetracked and then here I am. But it sounds like you guys are off to a roaring start. Um, I was like biting my biting my tongue, you know, because there's so much interesting shit that just got said that I was like, I can't just interrupt, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I was just going to say the last thing that kind of offended me was that, was that Hannibal is white in this? I think Hannibal oh, yeah. should be black. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, he should at least be like Vin Diesel black at least right. at the very <laughs> least. Right. Um, yeah, so Chris, he was a, he was a Phoenician, um, like um, an African Phoenician. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I was so, just going to say, wait, go l- let's, let's get into the history part a little bit to like contextualize like who some of the characters are. Um, so Chris, sure. can, you, can you tell us about Hannibal a little, a little bit and Scipio? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, let me like pull this, my notes up here, which I sometimes also refer to as Wikipedia, uh, for the untrained ear, but, <laughs> um, you know, um, so yeah, so, uh, we did an episode a long time ago when I first started as a co-host about the Phoenicians, right? Because we thought this was a really interesting, like ancient historical example of like, you know, trading empires, you know, sea people, et cetera, and how they could uh, uh, pull off like a vast political economic network without really owning a whole lot of like direct turf, you know? Right. Um, And so, you know, what they really did was they got real good at um, well, harnessing, you know, the, what their, their two main gods represented, which of course was wind and desire. Right. So it was kind of like this, like prefiguration of what we see in capitalism now, you know, especially in the, like the quote unquote age of discovery, age of exploration, that was really the age of European imperialism. Right. But the, you know, so, mm-hmm. so the Phoenicians, you know, they got off to an interesting start, um, where, um, the I was actually just talking to a couple of uh, my actually my friend uh, Mel who uh, has bounced around from coffee to coffee with, coffee with comrades and then you know that was a while ago and then now is um, we're just doing journalist work here on the side with the protests and stuff in, in here in Omaha and uh, was just telling her just like oh yeah you know stories of ancient badass women and one of them was this legend goes that um, this woman Dido who is an exile from the city of Tyre also Phoenician. Uh, she went off to North Africa and was like, you know, well, shit, like I got to live somewhere. And she had some followers and the, the local king said, well, you know, you can have as much land as an ox hide will cover. So then she being like a, a, a clever person, she got the like the, <laughs> she got them to slice the ox hide into like micro strips and then outline <laughs> this massive part of the coast and put a port <laughs> on it. <laughs> so that's the origin of Carthage in legend, at least. Um Eventually, Carthage was like about as big as Greece, at least like it was huge because of what the Phoenicians had already kind of prefigured. Right. So then the Carthaginian sort of empire or civilization or whatever was was a massive Mediterranean power. Um, and the Romans were kind of coming up, but they weren't like at this point, it was kind of like the Romans were in contention for like the, the you know, the bronze, silver or gold medal for power and Carthage. And I guess Greece were kind of like the the main contenders. Um, and I, man, I forget exactly how it happened, but the the Romans and the Carthaginians, I think because of a battle with somebody else, so they, they all got entangled in it. Then they became rivals and then they became like blood enemies, right? So what happened is Hannibal was this guy who he grew up in this like, um, you know, you see this in fucking, you know, in like what God. You know, graphic novels, you see it in legends, you see it in, in, you know, action movies, you see it in like political histories where somebody is they're They're born into a, a an intractably violent political conflict that is generations long. And so they are like born and bred to be the guy who does it, you know. And so Hannibal and his brother were raised to defeat Rome, like <laughs> literally like the just like the hardest motherfuckers, you know? Yeah. Um, so the, like, the so, Toyo Hisa of Carthage. Right. They're just like, we're going to do the thing that we've been trying to do for just decades, right? And of course, at this point, because, partly because Rome had been in, in conflict with Carthage, Rome was developing its own military prowess, right? So it's this is kind of the interesting thing about wars and states, is that states 
kind of require war in order to be both relevant and to gain power. It's like, you know, a boxer doesn't, you know, boxers got to got to fight to be good at anything. You know, they got to fight before they can win. Right. So so the Romans were kind of they were boxing and then they just they were like, all right, we're going to, you know, we're now in this intractable conflict. So so Hannibal literally born and bred to defeat Rome. Um, Scipio, I know less about probably just because he's like the, the big nerd who who you know, basically managed to chase Hannibal off after Hannibal just repeatedly owned the Romans for years. Like, you know, I mean, I think most people who are familiar with the um, the Punic Wars, which is, um, you know, we remember from Phoenicia episode um, that Punic is uh, another way to refer to Phoenicians, right? Same root uh, word. And so really what they were calling it was the Phoenician Wars, right? Because it was Carthage. Uh, and then Hannibal went on this like disastrous, well, sort of, I should say, not totally disastrous because he kind of won, <laughs> but he went on this like amazing, like costly, costly campaign where he marched the elephants over the uh, Spanish Alps, right? Oh. Right. So then, um, uh, excuse me, the Spanish, yeah, he marched it through fucking Iberia, through the Alps, into Italy, and then all the Romans were like um, pissing their pants, you know, or their togas, <laughs> I should say, you know? And they're and they're just like, what the hell do we do about this? Like, we didn't expect them to bring the elephants here because that just, you know, it took them thousands of miles to get there. So then, you know, Hannibal's just like trouncing them up and down the peninsula, and all the Romans are basically under siege at this point, right? Um, and I think that this is actually when. Let me just double check because I don't want to miseducate. Yes, right. So the, if you've ever heard the term Fabian strategy, um, it's when you basically. Um, you, you realize that you're in a, a losing side. And so then you um, uh, sort of attack the dominant um, force, right, through like a war of kind of guerrilla like attrition. So it's basically okay. like a, a type of guerrilla strategy um, from the weaker side that like just ups the costs for the dominant side. Um, and so then that was, you know, so, so Fabius was, was a, a general or a, a noble at least. Uh, who managed to kind of like kind of bleed Hannibal a bit while Hannibal was just like literally just running around Italy doing whatever the hell he wanted. Um, and then eventually, I believe Hannibal withdrew. Um, and then uh, and then Scipio went to Carthage and like literally leveled and killed everybody. And, and like the Romans themselves who were part of it, many of them were kind of like grossed out by the whole situation. <laughs> like they, they went so hard on it. Um, and then that's kind of why when people think of Carthage, they think of like massive tragedy because the ending was so bad for them uh, because the Romans were just like, no, we're just not even going to tolerate this kind of treatment anymore. We're going to, we're not going to tolerate enemies. We're not going to tolerate rivals, you know, and I think this actually itself prefigured the Roman attitude toward um, war from then on out. So cool. I have some notes on Japanese history. I'm not going to go over all of them because, you know, not all of it applies to the show. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to talk about like what the main characters are from. So the main characters are Togohisa Shimazu, Oda Nobunaga, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Yoichi no something. I forget mm -hmm. his surname. Um, so Yoichi is the most ancient character. He's from the Heian period, oh, yeah. which was from 794 to 1185. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's called the Heian period because the capital was in Heian Kyo, which is now mm -hmm. called Kyoto. Kyoto. Mm -hmm. Um, this is where the title of Shogun came about, which I think we mm -hmm. talked about on the first episode that you were on, Chris. Um, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. It, it means great barbarian subduing general. So right. it's basically like the guy who is the best at ethnic cleansing. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, it's, it's kind of like saying like head of DHS. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so he subdued the, I think this was when they subdued the Emi Shi, who, yeah. um, if you've ever seen Princess Mononoke, the main character from that is, is an Emi Shi person. Um, mm -hmm. So they are from Honshu, I think. And uh, yeah, so there was a general that became shogun by subduing the Emishi. And right. uh, let's see. Uh, this is where the practice of cloistered rule started, which is mm -hmm. where the de jure emperor, like the 
the supposed actual emperor uh, mm. doesn't have any real power. Um, the real power right. is held by his predecessor who retired early and just like kind of works behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, it's like an advisory elder type. Who's yeah. Like protected. Absolutely. You know, like they revere the guy, but they're like, you're not going to make a whole lot of decisions directly. You're just going to like give us some ideas and be like a really cool figurehead. Yeah. 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 He's like the Bush presidency basically. Um, <laughs> right, right, right. Or yeah. like what uh, Oda wants to do with uh, Toyohisa in this. <laughs> yes. Mm. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. He does pretty much do that. Um, Cause Toyo, he says supposedly the general, but he doesn't do it. He doesn't really do anything strategic. Hmm. Um, this is also the period where a lot of Japanese art comes from, like the, the like flat kind of, I don't know how to describe it. it the cool looking like color art that's, uh, flat, like 2d stuff is from this period. Um, so yeah, if you've seen yeah. any like old Japanese art, it might be from the Heian period. Um, let's see. After this is uh, feudal Japan from about 1185 to 1600. So um, toward the end of this is where Nobunaga and Toyohisa are from. Um, so they're from the Momoyama period, uh, which mm -hmm. was from 1568 to 1600. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is where like the most famous military people are from. Like if you've ever played Samurai Warriors, um, yep. this is where a lot of that game takes place. Uh, so, like, Nobunaga, Hideyoshi, Mitsuhide, um, all that stuff. Um, during this period, Hideyoshi attempted to invade Korea and got turned back by the Korean and Chinese armies. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and at the end of this period is when the probably most famous thing in feudal Japanese history happened, which is Tokugawa consolidates rule under a shogunate by winning the Battle of Sekigahara in 1600. Mm -hmm which started the Edo period. Um, and this is when the real uh, Shimazu Toyohisa died. Uh, in the final stages of the Battle of Sekigahara, um, the Shimazu clan was retreating, and he died protecting the clan's lord. Um, and apparently, mm -hmm. the Shimazu clan were like, like a de facto state, almost. Like, they were independent enough from the rest of the shogunate to be considered like their own kingdom essentially which i thought was interesting um so after this was the edo period that's one of the longest periods of history from 1600 to 1868 that's when the capital moved to edo which is uh part of tokyo currently um and the tokugawa shogunate ruled uh there was like a isolationist policy but they were also very literate and numerate uh, which is a word i always forget about <laughs> <laughs> and uh, had a lot of culture and art, and this is when geisha existed. I meant to point something out about another period. Where... Yeah, yeah, no, sorry. So oh, the, uh, oh, the Muromachi yeah, period right before uh, the yeah, Momoyama mm -hmm. period. That's when all the cool shit that we love about Japan happened, like ninja, warrior monks, bonsai, yep. tea ceremonies, ikebana. That's yep. that's when all that stuff is from. So 1333 to 1568. Um, yeah. That's also that's... when the first Europeans arrived. Um, mm -hmm. they were on a Chinese ship and like got blown there by accident. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, that's how Christianity made it to Japan. Um, and then the last like re couple relevant periods for Japanese history for this show are, uh, the Showa period, which was 1926 to 1989. That's when Emperor Hirohito reigned. Uh, we already know most of that stuff. We had fascist Imperial Japan. That's where two of the characters are from, um, I th I don't think one of them had shown up in the main twelve episodes. The um, the admiral of the Hiryu, the aircraft carrier. No, was he in the shows? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so they have an, an admiral of a famous aircraft carrier in the later part of the series. So whenever the rest of the show comes out, uh, you'll you'll see more of him. And then there's the I can't remember the pilot's name, the really foul mouth pilot who they started calling him a sky god. Do you remember his name, Leslie? Uh, no. Um, I just call. Uh, yeah, I don't remember his name. Pilot guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So he he's from the oh, same. Oh, uh, Naoshi Kano. Is his name. Oh, that's right. Okay, thanks. 
Um, Which is interesting. Another thing about how this show addresses like um, Japan's war crimes, uh, Kano has PTSD from our bombing of Tokyo, and that's right. why he starts fighting the dragons. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. It's not like no one had PTSD, which right. I guess so. You know, it's but that is a how much un- you portray yourself versus your enemies as victims. You know? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. That's that's, that's yeah. Sorry, Leslie. I think you're saying something. Oh yeah, I just saying that's kind of an under rest, uh, under uh, discussed war crime uh, to the fire bombing, separate from the um, nuclear uh, bombing. Yeah. because like yeah. fire bombing killed just as many people and even more uh, horrifically. Like there was so much yeah. fire mm-hmm. and smoke and bo- from the bombing. Like I would rather get vaporized o- instantly than burned to death. Right. Yeah, and not even burned to death. Like the. Um, if there was so much fire, it would suck all the oxygen right. out and create yeah. like vacuum. Mm-hmm. So people are just choking to death. Yeah. Suffocating. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. there's the famous uh, movie that probably everyone knows, um, Grave of the Fireflies, about the firebombing of Tokyo. Um, mm-hmm. There's also another good movie. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, Leslie, called uh, In This Corner of the World. Uh, no. Uh, so that's about... It's like a similar kind of story. It's like civilian life in Japan under uh, during World War II. Um, although I think it's a little... Well, maybe it's not more favorable because Grave of the Fireflies is pretty favorable to Japan in terms of like, it's really bad that that happened to them. Um, but yeah, this one is about Hiroshima uh, and Kure. So the main character is from Hiroshima. She moves to Kure. And her family dies in the atomic bombing. Um, so, yeah, if you haven't seen that movie, it's I really recommend it. It's great. Um, might turn you into a little bit of a Japanese nationalist. Like when you watch it, when you watch it, man, you know, you, pre- you become a Chinese nationalist. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, well, there's two, uh, two things. Two empires can be bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't right. have to pick one or the other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so. I think some of my favorite characters were the French characters in the show. Uh, there was Joan of Arc, uh, G. De Ray, and uh, uh, Comte de Saint Germain. Uh, Joan Joan of Arc was uh, she has like fire magic powers, which I thought was cool. <laughs> She's like kind of a super crazy like pyro character. Nice. Yeah, religious zealot. Like she was, she was cool. She uh, like it. It was funny because they've done like so many like uh, thing like Japanese versions of Joan of Arc. So it's kind of weird really? seeing her. It's kind of like yeah, like there there's video games. The Claymore stuff tries to kind of look like uh, oh, the, yeah. like, tries to be kind of like a Joan of Arc kind of thing. I think there's uh, anime just called Joan of Arc too. Like there. Uh, there, mm-hmm. so it's kind of like seeing seeing her, and this is kind of like seeing like Batman show up because the character <laughs> has been in a bunch of stuff already. Um, so I I was reading a little bit about Joan of Arc because I I never remember like what her actual role in history is. You know, you know the name, but not necessarily the history around her. So uh, if you forget, like me. She is the famous cross-dressing woman who fought the English occupation of France in the Hundred Years' War. Uh, One thing that I found that was really interesting about her cross-dressing thing was um, it was, like, criminalized to dress as a man at that point, which I'm sure won't come as a surprise to many people. But uh, when she was imprisoned, uh, she refused to change her clothes because the soldier's clothing that she wore, like, fastened together, like, the pants and boots and... Uh, belt and all that stuff like and tunic fastened together so it was like really hard for her captors to like rape her um so at one point they made her wear a dress and like as soon as that happened some local lord came and and tried to assault her and she started wearing the soldier's clothing again um yeah um gidre was a commander in the french army who fought alongside joan of arc um so 100 years war as well uh he retired around 1435 and he used his accumulated wealth to put on an extravagant theater production that he wrote 
which I think is funny. <laughs> um, he also dabbled in the occult, so he he did like alchemical experiments and three times tried to summon and contract with a demon named Baron. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 1440, he was tried and executed for serial child murder by the ecclesiastical authorities. And, but many uh, people, including Aleister Crowley, have disputed his guilt and believe it was a revenge plot by the church uh, because of his practice of witchcraft. Um, so they just framed him for child murder. <laughs> Um, and he's also thought to be the inspiration for the French folktale Bluebeard. Um, and I, I guess I should mention he's he's the big giant guy with the the spear and chain weapon that fights Yoichi in episode seven, I think. Yeah, and gets and gets wrecked. Uh, yeah, as well. <laughs> I, like, I think that was my favorite episode. Yeah, it, it's a nice fight, but he's like the most anime guy in the show yeah. <laughs> and he they immediately like wet him uh turn the salt actually <laughs> it was a it was a good time for yoichi to shine too um oh one thing i didn't mention they they talk about this in the show but um there's some like famous folktale about yoichi where there were a bunch of soldiers near a dock and someone put a target on like on top of a small boat and like cha challenged the soldiers around to shoot the target and no one was willing to do it except for Yoichi who like bullseyed it in one shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, Sanjami, the offensive Okama character, uh, she in real life was a, uh, was a man. Uh, mm. He was a pretty interesting historical figure. Uh, who was like a diplomat and wrote a bunch of music and was interested in like alchemy and science and stuff like that, but has almost there's like almost no confirmed biographical information about him uh, because he just lied constantly. <laughs> so like <laughs> he at one point claimed to be 500 years old <laughs> and also claimed to be the son of Prince Francis II of Transylvania. Um, <laughs> but like no one knows where he's from because like one person said his, he, his French and Italian was not very good, you know, he's called, you know, Comte de Saint-Germain, um, and his native language seems to be Spanish or Portuguese. So, mm. uh, and as far as I know, that's not where Transylvania is. So not, not sure where they're from. <laughs> um, there's also uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sand Sundance Kid in the show. Yeah, but they don't get to do much, sadly. Yeah, they don't. They don't mm. really talk a lot. They just fire a Gatling gun, which is kind of cool. <laughs> um, so they, if if you don't know, I didn't really know anything about them. Uh, they operated from 1899 to 1901, and they were like train robbers. Um, but their biggest crime was uh, violating trademark law because there's another gang called the Wild Bunch. Uh, that was led by Bill Dalton, like ten years earlier. So <laughs> I think that's what we really need to be concerned with. Um, yeah, seems wrong. <laughs> uh, These so criminals we didn't... gotta clean up their act. Go ahead. Yeah, we we didn't get your take. Uh, what, what did you think of the show overall? Um, I unfortunately because of this last couple of weeks being pretty crazy. I didn't get to see more than a few episodes. I was really interested in it. Um, but I also did notice, uh, you know, maybe like, um, this is just kind of like me being like less familiar with, um, isekais, um, and also, uh, being like really interested as usual in like, what, what are the political undertones of the, of the, of the story. Right. So like, of course, you know, you watch something like attack on Titan, which is a more kind of like, at least in terms of its format, it's a straight fantasy, you know, um, and then, but then also it's like sort of stressorist and weird uh, and, and like xenophobic or like, you know, Oh, the outside inside forces and stuff like that, you know? So, whereas this one, uh, the, the little I got to see of it, I was like, okay, like I'm just like, there, there seems to be a cosmological uh, kind of conflict going on. That's drawing these sort of, you know, uh, canonical historical warriors into this fantasy world right um 
So whereas something like, let's just pull Narnia out of our asses, you know, something like Narnia, it's like, oh, these kids fall through a fucking accidental portal and they just kind of happen to adapt and then they become part of the mythos. Whereas in this case, it's like, because these people were part of the mythos in our world, they got drawn into this other world where there's some other conflict going on. Um, I think there was this really interesting moment. I don't know if you guys touched on it at all, but where, um, uh, shoot, the Shimazu character um toyohisa Toyohisa, right he you know i really i really appreciated his kind of like his fire you know um yeah but it was really interesting when like the the elves were like oh we can only fuck like once a year and 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 he's like ah oh. and then they're like and that's how they're like killing our population which of course on its own it's like well yeah genocide sucks and it's bad and you should stop it you know but it's so funny how like the way that at least the subs maybe the the, the way the subs were translated i don't know about the original language uh, uh like the nuances but the, he was talking about like you know you know you ha you men have to be men and go and get your wives your children like kind of talking about this like very like nationalistic sounding shit you know where it's like you got to get your fucking breeding cattle back so you can have a future as men you know and i was like oh, that's an interesting <laughs> little uh <laughs> like i've heard people say shit like that before in the real world <laughs> you know <laughs> So, so I was like, I was wondering where it was going to go with that, if it was going to continue down that line, you know, because again, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get to see the whole season. Um, but yeah. Yeah. But um, that's, I think what we were, what they try to get across there, uh, especially yeah. later on is that like, Toyohisa yeah. is from a specific time period and like mm -hmm. protecting mm -hmm. his clan and his family is the only thing that matters to him. So that's how. Absolutely. That's, and that's a great point. Yeah. So that's kind of him that trying, yeah. That's kind of him trying to mm -hmm. put his values on it, and but like someone like uh, Nobunaga, he like sees that and kind of mm -hmm. like snickers and laughs at it, even though he's from Japan uh, yeah. too. And what we consider, we don't really think of like a period, a difference between like his time period and Toyohisa's. We we think that you know mm -hmm. it's kind of all this flattened thing, but no, there's cultural differences, and all these people have individual individual like quirks and passions and things going on on too i really yeah, think could even be a class difference too since yeah. nobunaga would have been more of an elite exactly exactly like yeah. the, yeah, sure. like yeah. i think the show really takes seriously all the character as silly as the show kind of is of just like mm -hmm. taking historical figures like he-man toys and bashing them together like it, it right. really does try to take okay what exactly was would, would this person feel or think uh it at this uh during this situation given their time period given what we know about their history you know it, it really is kind of, it, I, I really in, enjoy how like diverse all the viewpoints are in this for the characters like each has their own voice that they speak with and none of them really end up sounding the same which can happen with so many anime yeah, yeah no, I really like point. that um, a lot of the characters, like, get their minds blown by the differences in technology. Yeah. So, like, when the uh, when Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid shoot the Gatling gun, uh, it gives Nobunaga the idea, like, hey, we should make guns yeah. and <laughs> own everyone in this world because they don't know what a gun is. <laughs> right, okay. right, right. And then it, what was it? It was – and then some of the characters that were kind of further in the future – they came, with, yeah. It was Butch Cassidy and the son of kid, but uh -huh. I think it applies to Hitler too. Um, when yeah. they they had been, they had come so far from the future that they no longer knew how to make gunpowder, but uh, Nobunaga oh, yeah. had to make it himself. He didn't have like an industrial machine uh, making it for them, like the like the cowboys uh, uh, did. So he was able to to um, replicate it because that's what he was actually doing in his time period mm -hmm. i just realized mm -hmm. this is also the second isekai that we've talked about during this mini series where one of the main characters are making gunpowder is like a major plot point <laughs> so we talked about dr stone and that was like one of the main early story points is they're trying to make gunpowder to win a war <laughs> See that that's a, um, this show got me thinking like what if i have if i you know get 
a vase drop on my head and I wake up in a, like a different time or different place. What's the most valuable thing I can remember how to make? In right. order to, I you don't know. know we actually, we, that was one of the things we talked about in, in the Dr. Stone episode. So what, what do you think? Mm-hmm. What, what would be the thing that you would make? Shit. Oh uh, God. It is really hard. Cause like I would want to, you know, improve humanity. So something like penicillin, uh, would be uh, really nice, but you gotta protect. But depending on what time period I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna need some like protection of some sort. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I'd probably try to look up like something that people don't know is poison yet. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess the problem is like a lot of us are pretty de-skilled unless you're like a specialist in you know chemistry or something like that. You don't necessarily know how stuff is made. Um. It was easier to answer for uh, the Dr. Stone episode because they're in the Stone Age. So like any technology that you <laughs> like know the basics of how it works, you can make like so we were like bricks and, you know, something uh, round. pickling and stuff like that. <laughs> the shape, the, squ- the shape of a square like would blow their minds. Yeah. <laughs> a, a right angle. Uh, basic arithmetic. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> you show them like a cat's cradle thing and they're like, oh, Jesus, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so like in, in current Dr. Stone uh, volumes or chapters, I mean, uh, one of the main antagonists has created a Haber-Bosch process chemical plant so that he can make unlimited amounts of gunpowder. Um, so we're not quite on that level, I think. we're not. He's a, He's a NASA scientist, so... Oh, we're not okay. that smart. <laughs> um, I thought the way that the gunpowder is made, though, is really cool. Um, they talk about it in episode five and a couple other ones, I think. Nobunaga mixes corpses with grass, dirt, urine, and feces and throws it all in a saltpeter mine, and that turns it into gunpowder. I, yeah, he well, he turns it into a saltpeter mine. I think it, he turns oh, okay. the corpses into because mm-hmm. you get you can get the uh, saltpeter from corpses. Which I I mm-hmm. looked this up is actually not the most efficient, but it appears in fiction a lot just because it sounds so fucking like brutal and cool. Like yeah. like even like <laughs> the mass <laughs> like in the Mass Max video game, it has you finding mass graves for saltpeter. In reality, like a horse stall was like a good place for saltpeter too, wherever they. Okay. <laughs> they do actually mention that in the later uh volumes uh like the the manga volumes um Sanjami is talking to uh this leader of like a trading like seafaring trading nation which they translated as s h a i r o c k but i think the actual translation and like what what it's intended to be is shylock oh, which is yeah. kind of fucked up right um, right. but Sandra Mee points out that the Orte empire, because it's like an agricultural powerhouse and has lots of horses, uh, they're easily able to make gunpowder because they have lots of shit. So yeah, they, they do talk about that actually. Um, let's see. Uh, one, one thing I did want to talk about is, uh, only new, uh, I, I don't really like that the only female main character is just like a fan service character, basically. And yeah. they have a, a joke for her about her name that like really doesn't translate well. In, in Japanese, they call her Opainu, which means like Opai is boobs. And her mm-hmm. name is Ominu. So it's supposed to be a pun on that. But uh, how did they translate it in the dub? Did you hear that, Leslie? Oh, uh, in the... What is it? In the dub... Um... He, uh, how they, I, they've never, well, by the time I switched to the dub, they'd stop saying her name because the joke is oh, that okay. they, they treat her like the waitress from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. So he, so he never, so Oda never actually says her name. Yeah, because in the subs, they translated as booby new, which is like not. No, not it, it, it was <laughs> oh something. It was oh something. I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Yeah. It, there was in no the, in the manga, they translated as like Omi nipples, which is a little funnier. <laughs> <laughs> but still i think it just does not translate at all no i think it would have been better if they just like changed her name completely so that they yeah, could make a pun yeah, out of it yeah yeah i don't know why they don't like they don't do James that Bond, but like girl yeah. yeah 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 but I, I would just say like i really when 
talk back to the kind of gun power thing when he mentioned like uh-huh. in two years we'll have you know salt peter i was like oh this show is kind of on like a bigger scale than i initially thought like i thought it was just going to be like all the drifters will fight all the ends and kill each other and that would be the war and it's like oh no this is like a, a war war show even more so than a game of thrones where it's going to be taking place this campaign that's going to take place over years and across this you know big map so i i really like like the direction of it um it i don't it doesn't seem like the anime might ever get finished really uh yeah (laughs) but it's more but like um the manga i'm glad the uh, manga is still going I, i definitely would uh, like to check it out because I, I like the like it's just on a really big uh, scale um, and you don't and it, and with a interesting character is an interesting concept. Yeah, it seems like uh, what's his name? Kota is that was that his name? Yeah, Hirano Kota. It seems like he's kind of slow at at actually like producing this stuff because it's already been going since two thousand eight, and it's only out in chapter seventy nine. Um, I think it might be because he does all the art himself. Yeah. Well, um, one of the things we were talking about in the Dr. Stone episode is like more manga artists now are, uh, just it's, it'll be like a, a writer and an artist team and the writer will right. write and storyboard the manga and then the artist actually draws the art. Um, but, uh, our guest Daniel was saying one of the things he liked about, uh, manga was that it, it was you know writer and artist were the same person yeah it's a gift and a curse you know because if yeah. if, uh, if if uh, if it's a writer and an artist separately if one gets bored unmotivated a bigger opportunity then one then you know the thing can still continue but like this is the only thing he can do basically um yeah until it's finished and uh as you know berserk long-suffering berserk fans feel like there's a, there could be a lot of pain involved waiting on these you know geniuses who are you know like doing this gr- rather grueling work at times like me physically grueling uh a work uh but um the the results are uh fantastic it just it takes a very long time yeah um so I was reading about the Black King and uh I don't know he's not like a very fleshed out character in the anime I think mm-hmm. he's just kind of like in the background like you said he's like a Sauron character um <laughs> but there's like fan theories that he is actually Jesus <laughs> Yeah I think that's true I think that, I think <laughs> I think I think that that's very very true in fact I remember I was I was thinking of an idea of a comic book where uh-huh. Jesus where like the gods would be characters like all the gods from the, all the different religions and like the powers that they assign to Jesus and this are the same ones I would assign to him if you try to think of him as like instead of a divine figure who can do anything you think of he, him as someone who just has super impressive superpowers so him having um control over organic matter you know that hey that's that's Lazarus. That's you know the loaves of fish and, right. the, and the, uh, I guess not the guess yeah the bread 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 to uh, uh, no not I I guess you know, I guess it depends on how they make the bread but whatever the fact that he can make you know stuff is um, it has certain controls over over that as like a more of like a superpower than like a divine you know ability to do anything like i i was like yeah that is how jesus would appear and he would be like super mad at humans for rejecting him and so he would try to wipe <laughs> them out and like try to preach his gospel uh to the kobolds and the goblins yeah that was a uh, one thing i guess we haven't really talked about was like what the drifters and the enders are doing which like each of them are uh uniting like different races and countries to fight a like larger war against each other which is i think a fairly uh cool and interesting like overall story to go with um toward the end we see that um the black king has uh gotten the the like different races of monsters kobolds and goblins and stuff to like develop civilization um so like in 
the first OVA, episode 13, um, there are two spies at their like main settlement and he they see that um they are doing like trade uh they're like making money uh th- which the way they do that is really brutal there's there's this dragon that's made of bronze and like every time a part of his flesh gets cut off it like regrows it instantly so they've chained him down and are just like cutting pieces of flesh off of him and melting it down <laughs> to like bronze Jesus. coins um one thing i thought was funny about uh the what the spies were saying though is they are talking about how there's these slaves they have human slaves and they're like we had slavery in our countries and we still have slavery in some of them but we are very different in one decisive point we don't eat our slaves so like (laughs) they think they're better because they're they don't eat slaves, I guess, which <laughs> I don't find that a whole lot better personally. I don't know. <laughs> right. Oh my God. <laughs> and he even like compares it to cattle and it's like, well, cattle are kind of, I mean, they're not human, but they're still like, you use them as draft animals and you eat them. So yeah. I don't know. <laughs> right. A little ethically ambiguous there. Um, God, what, what was I going with? Oh yeah, um, yeah. So the the drifters as well are like uniting these different races. So they bring together elves and dwarves and humans. Um, yeah. So I guess like initially I thought the politics of the show are like pretty fascist, but if the whole thing is that each side is like saying that you know different races should work together then maybe not as much. Yeah, I, I don't really think the show, I mean, even if though it literally has fascist, uh, historical fascist uh, characters right. in it, but they, they, uh, Hitler does kill himself again in this one. <laughs> but, uh, oh, really? I missed that. Yeah, yeah. He, kill, he kills, he, he establishes uh, Orta and then he kills himself. Um, but I guess he's just a very sad boy. Yeah, but uh, no, no, I think the show is like, it. it's, like so there's all already like a three a multi there's a two side conflict going on between like the guy in the office and the dark haired woman that we don't know what's going on with that and then we have the orta and the human races versus the drifters and the elves and the dwarves versus the black king and his goblins and kobolds and like none of these you know groups uh except for maybe the elves because they were so victimized are really presented as being like wholly like innocent or wrong or right uh like the the night the all the black the black kings um like maybe his you know the ends are like bad people but like i don't think we're supposed to think like the pigmen and the goblins like they seem to just be fighting for like the life that they deserve that humans have denied them and the humans yeah. are like a fascist empire erected by literally by hitler like that's who the goblins right. are going <laughs> after so like the show really hitler and shylock <laughs> yeah the the show really like complicates uh, like the uh, these traditional um, uh, fantasy uh, tropes by having, you know, Mm -hmm. all these different factions with all these different understandable uh, motivations. Like the humans are really shitty, but at least maybe they're not, but there are, trying to the, the black king is trying to simply eradicate them and that's bad too so i i, I really I, I enjoy Although that's everything. according to the humans isn't it according to the humans that the black king is trying to eradicate them so maybe he isn't really no no he is he is he does want to eradicate. okay he does he, he says there's a scene where he actually says to his second command yeah where yeah i do want to kill all the humans and uh, take over and okay. leave it um to that's why he's teaching the the, the god he's no worse than bender from futurama then you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um but yeah that, that's a good point about the monsters like i mean if they are able to start doing agriculture and trade wouldn't they have been capable of that the whole time so maybe it was just 
the humans' fault that they were mere monsters. Yeah, yeah. I think you're definitely supposed to think it because the the humans did the same thing to the elves and the dwarves who right. end up fighting for our drifter heroes. So it just seems like humans have like. Uh, uh, chickens are coming home to roost on the humans, and now they are going to have to rely on the people they oppress, which are the dwarves and the elves, in order to save their asses. That's basically what's happening. <laughs> it's like, um, yeah, the underclasses are rising up to save the, their oppressors, oppressors from an even you know, greater possible threat. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what what were your favorite episodes or moments of the show, Leslie? Um, I, I, I don't think I have a favorite episode, but I, I just like any time uh, Toya Hisa would just jump in and be like guts and just cut down yeah. like hundreds of people. <laughs> like I just I really thought that w- the way they did it in this show was really slick. Uh, he's He can be kind of a one note character at times more than the others, but I... I but it really comes across as kind of cool in this context where it is not really a realistic show, but it's not like it, it, it's a little bit more realistic than just like a Dragon Ball Z type show. So right. to him, see him throw mm-hmm. himself into battle and fight and be like a complete badass until, you know, he gets like almost like murdered a couple of times. Like I really, I really liked mm-hmm. him. I really liked all his, all his fight scenes. Yeah, I think the thing that really sucked me into the show, because the first episode for me was just okay. I think maybe I was only half paying attention to it, so I didn't really get super into it. But in episode two, when he like does like a wrestling takedown on that guy and just like beats his face in with his sword oh, sheath. Oh, yeah, that was uh, really good. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chris, did you have any moments that you liked in particular? Um, again, I, I unfortunately still haven't seen you know, the, the majority of the show, although, you know, what I saw, I enjoyed, you know, um, I, you know, I, I really definitely, like, I saw that with Toya, he said, like, you know, he's, he's got this kind of gut streak and I always, I always love that shit, you know, his kind of just like ability to just jump in and, and, you know, kick ass. Um, Nobunaga kind of entertains me as a character. I mean, like the fan service part is super annoying. We talked about that before Ryan, you and me, um yeah i i really i really hate this that is the anti-horny it's, anime podcast <laughs> right and i'm like you know as a as a as a pretty openly horny guy i just find that shit tasteless anyway you know it's like, really man like on, I, I i i think i think there is like a cultural like translation difference because so much yeah, in japan yeah. that we consider like sexy and sexual is just like funny yeah, yeah. it's just like co- right, a staple right, right. a comedy you know staple now i'm not saying that staple is necessarily good or needs to be continued For sure. uh, forever but it, it it does take on like a different context and i kind of just kind of roll my eyes at it and just keep moving oh <laughs> you know yeah. like it, it's yeah. not what i'm into but you know whatever yeah, I would say, Leslie, I agree with you that, like, that's more my, like, emotional reaction to it is that it's, it's an eye roller, you know, like, I see it as kind of like, a, um, you know, uh, it's got kind of like that vaudeville slapstick, like, old school, just like honka honka kind of like humor to yeah. it where you're like, all right, man, you know, like, um, as long as it doesn't take like an entire scene up, you know, which, uh, you know, does occasionally happen. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so the, yeah, you're, you're completely right on that. Uh, but like Nobunaga is a character. I always, I always appreciate also like as, a, as the flip side of the foil to like the, like the skilled and brutality characters like Toyohisa. Um, I like the guys who are like, Hmm. So these are the conditions of this conflict. Like I know exactly how to deal with this. You know, like I'm gonna do gunpowder. I'm gonna do this and that. Yeah, you know, it's I'm so nice. Flip, flip it on a head. It's so nice to see mm-hmm. a character that's we're we're never even told that he's smart. We just know he is from all the smart things he does. Exactly. Exactly. He demonstrates his intelligence. Yeah. 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 Versus a lot of the yeah, Leslie. I think that's that's a good way to put it. You know, like it reminds me of in some animes. Um, often, often there's like a, an intelligent character, like a glasses character or something, or like a super elite high collar kind of character. You know these tropes, and um, you do you just kind of hear like, oh, they're top of their class, or like, oh, that's the famous person who's you know got the reputation for for high intelligence, and then. Um, ultimately plot wise or, or dialogue wise, these people ultimately just 
end up performing magic. You know, like yeah. like it, it may not be like you know what I mean? It's not like spells or stuff, but like like they do what is essentially magic as far as we're aware. Like, like the we're Benedict Cumberbatch uh, like Sherlock magic. show. Yeah. Yes. Right. It's not really a stratagem. It's like they're just just kind of ass polling intelligence, you know. <laughs> but yeah, and that's kind of the thing yeah. I appreciate about this because this could be a much lazier mm -hmm. thing. But it seems like I feel like I'm actually learning about like how this dude took over Japan, you know, from like strategy. Right, exactly. I feel like he probably just like studied the history and pulled out some stuff to put in the manga. Um, yeah, like of, some of the tactics of you, that he uses, you can look it up and like they're real. Like when he, um puts uh all the shit into the wells that's like a real tactic that's like very common right. yep. um yep. so yeah he definitely must have studied this stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm actually looking forward to now that i've i've uh seen you know the few episodes but like with these historical characters in it um i actually just ordered um three books it's like a trilogy on uh, the history of Japan, by, it's like supposed to be a really good history, um, you know, from like, you know, prehistory to, to the 1300s, from the 1300s to the 1600s, and then from the 1600s through to like the mid 1800s. And then there's also a book that I got on peasant rebellions in Japan, nice. and another one that's called like, and it was, you know, it was published in like the 80s or something. So, you know, it might have aged a little bit, but like, it is a history. So and, and that one's on um what I think it's called native sources of industrialization in Japan. Um, so kind of like an industrial history. So I'm going to be really pouring through those in my free time. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing like what I'm about to learn from these books about possibly um, Shimazu's and the, the, you know, the Oda's um, and so forth, you know, what they were actually up to. Cause I've read, you know, I did Asian studies in college, but I, you know, undergrad is one level um, versus like, once you're at the graduate level and you're like really trying to get through the dry stuff, you know, like you learn so much more and find that maybe like stuff you learned before was not actually, you know, true. <laughs> so it'd be interesting. Yeah. Let's, let's do some episodes on that. Once you, uh, once you get through it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I would, I would love to. Yeah. Um, fuck. What was I going to say? Well, do we have any last thoughts then? I guess we're coming up on the ideal podcast length. Yeah, I just say again, like I, I really ended up liking a lot about this show. The only thing I would hesitate about recommending it is be, is that it is unfinished, and it kind and you right. kind in the last episode kind of ends on uh just you know like a retreat in a battle that it, but that is one thing i liked about this show it's so much like war media that we see like no one ever retreats especially any of the protagonists you never see them back down but this they're like oh retreat mm. and they they just go and retreat because yeah. they're actual soldiers and they value right. their life um yeah, but yeah but yeah but uh, this one, it, it, I, I I wish there were there was more of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll definitely be checking out the manga. I, I want to know how the story ends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, one thing I forgot to mention is the translations of the like the fan subs after the main twelve episodes. Uh, episode thirteen is okay. Episode fourteen is unfucking watchable. Um, I was telling Leslie before <laughs> we started of this mm -hmm. these couple of lines that just made me give up on watching the fan sub um uh -huh. one character i think it was the sundance kid says pumped very fragrant thing give me a and then uh <laughs> butch cassidy says me too and then the sundance kid says what the uncle really disappointed and then that admiral of the hero you <laughs> says saying we are not enemies at the beginning just bring someone looking for you <laughs> <laughs> like oh my god the, the only way i think this could have happened is if like someone did automatic captions in the original japanese and then took the automatic captions and plugged it into like not even google translate but like babblefish <laughs> um so yeah definitely <laughs> if you want to keep going with it read the manga the manga translations aren't perfect but they're much better than that <laughs> um so yeah, I, yeah, I, sounds painful. Leslie, I think you turned around, turned me around on this. I was like a little down on it, but I think I was just letting the weebs get to me because I was reading. I, I always read reviews to see if there's anything funny to bring up on the podcast, and uh, 
yeah, I think I was taking them a little too seriously because they were saying the characterization is bad and this and that. But um, I think you're right. They just don't uh, they don't say it overtly, like what the characters are like. And a lot of people mistake that for bad characterization. Yeah. Yeah. So, Leslie, thank you again for coming on. Your podcast is a lot more popular than mine, so I don't know if you want to plug it. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me on patreon.com slash struggle session. All right. Awesome. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone.